passion of football began as a runner's game, but it prospered and grew with the discovery of flight. Only one man commands the flight of a football. He is the quarterback. This is a story about the greatest quarterbacks who have ever played in the National Football League. Men who earned fame and glory, each in his own way. This is red, right, flip. 61, double shoot. All right, 75 double choice. Flanker, Argo out, MK go on two. An open four right, 29 geo, slot drag. Go on the deuce. Just red left, center, 57, wing delay, fullback corner on one. Red right, tower 49, near geo, it's on two. It's on two, ready? No Break. position in football requires as many different skills as quarterback. It requires a cool head. 55, three, and a tough butt. Here he comes. Come on, Dave! Well, I know it. I, you know, hell, I didn't. I, I got a throw back there after a while. In the history of a national football league. Many have played the position, but only a few can be called the best ever. The camera's eye is drawn to the quarterback. He is football's equivalent of the Hollywood matinee idol. And his image combines arm with charm. These gables and grants of the gridiron don't leave footprints in cement. But a wristband leaves a similar impression on adoring fans. The best passers of the modern era are big box office, and their heroic identities are worthy of any movie ever. For 10 years, Oakland's quarterback played the role of a crafty snake. Baltimore features a sharpshooter called the Rustin Rifle. Cleveland's hero engineers more last-second rescues than Errol Flynn. And San Diego's main attraction is an aerial ace who commands a daring dawn patrol. These stars further the tale of golden arms, glamour boys and folk heroes that marks the evolution of the pro-passing game. The tale begins in 1937, when Sammy Baugh joined the Redskins and ushered in a new era for NFL offenses. In 1945, Baugh established a still unequaled NFL single-season accuracy record by completing 70% of his passes. This was the stuff of folk legend and helped immortalize him as Slingin' Sam. In the 50s, Bob Waterfield aligned his legend with that of his wife, leading lady Jane Russell. Waterfield was the leading man of an explosive Rams offense that in 1950 averaged over 38 points a game. Still an NFL record. Bob Waterfield's on-field Midas touch and his off-the-field golden boy image 
brought the pro quarterback further into the spotlight. During the 60s, the golden boy with the golden arm was the Redskins' fun-loving Sonny Jerkis. It was a golden arm that worked in forward and reverse. Come game time, that arm worked in overdrive. Jurgensen's passes struck like lightning, and he became the NFL's second-ranked quarterback of all time. Yet Washington, D.C. was too small for Sonny Jurgensen's big talent and his appetite for post-game good times. He was perhaps better suited to the hustle and bustle of New York City. But in 1965, the town belonged to Joe Ning, whose eyes melted many a Manhattan lady. He earned the tag Broadway Joe and became pro football's ultimate glamour boy. His outrageous bad boy image fascinated millions who followed his after dark exploits. Sometimes they talk about drinking and conniving around with ladies and stuff. You know, it seems almost un-American to me for a bachelor not to, marry, you know, go around uh, having a drink with a lady now and then. And how, why all of a sudden that's become an evil in me, uh, I don't know. But some people don't like it. Well, you can't please any everybody. Uh, I'm just uh, <laughs> trying to get along, you know, just, <laughs> just trying to get by. Look at that shot. In 1967, the Jets' Namath became the first quarterback in pro football history to pass for over 4,000 yards in one season. It was 12 years before this feat was duplicated. He was a fiery competitor who met all challenges head on. Namath was a young man on the move, propelled by the speed with which he unloaded a football, the special zip in his arm, and an unwavering belief in his abilities. I don't know where anybody else's head is. I, I don't know what kind of game they call. I feel that I, I've made very few mental errors in professional football over the last few years. I feel I can throw as well or better than anybody. and. Uh, I think mentally, throwing the football, uh, well, I feel confident I can play better than anybody that's ever played the position. Namath's bravado was justified. In 1968, he brought Jet fans an AFL title, then brashly predicted victory over heavily favored Baltimore in Super Bowl III. It was no empty boast. Namath passed for over 200 yards in the Jets' stunning win. The first ever for an AFL team. He earned MVP honors and respect for the other league that would soon become dominant. But then Joe Namath was always a trendsetter. And his arm remained in fashion long after Super Bowl III. In 1972, he led the NFL in passing yardage. In a victory against Baltimore that season, he passed for 496 yards and six touchdowns. His marvelous arm could still electrify a crowd and send a charge through his teammates. Joe Namath's arm rarely failed him, but his knees did. The surgeon's knife and the defender's cutting blow upended Namath from his position on top of the world. With the life drained from his knees, 
Namath lost control of his drop-back skills. Like Manhattan, the pass pocket had once been Namath's personal playground. It eventually became his burial ground. The glitter of a sparkling career had turned to dust, but the image endures, especially in that moment in January 1969 when Broadway Joe Namath proved that he deserved to bat in the spotlight. can provide him with a crown of thorns or a jewel-studded garden. Terry Bradshaw achieved royal status, while Archie Manning had a cross to bear, the New Orleans Saints. In 1971, Manning joined this lowly franchise, but his arm promised that in the NFL at least, the South would rise again. Manning blossomed into one of the game's best, and he was named NFC Player of the Year for 1978. Yet, the Saints had never known a winning season, and Manning was seen as the perpetual savior of a team that could not save itself. Nor could the Saints save Manning from the onslaught of enemy defenses. Here was one Johnny Webb who heard the bugle sound retreat all too often. This scrambling fox wore out many a hound. But Archie Manning's misfortune is that his own team has yet to keep pace with his considerable talent. Terry Bradshaw inherited a team that couldn't keep pace with anyone. Golly, could nothing be greater happen to Terry Bradshaw than to go up to Pittsburgh and make Pittsburgh a winner. Team from 1 and 13, change it around, make it 13 and 1 or 14. You know, make them a winner. The Steelers won five games in 1970 as the raw rookie displayed both a man's arm and a child's exuberance. For an eager rookie, one good game can make the future look bright. In the first two games, every time we started dropping back, everything was real fuzzy, yeah. you know? And now it's just all sort of, you know, don't even worry about it. Yeah. That's where I've always wanted to feel. I feel if I ever get like that, everything would be it's all right. It's going to get better. Yeah, I mean, I was dropping back, and I could see the defense, and see him going into the weak zone and everything. I could see the whole picture. I knew exactly where to go. Yeah. If that continues, you know, that's going to be great. But greatness was interrupted by moments when Bradshaw looked like he was auditioning for Hee Haw. In the early years, Miss Cues earned him ridicule from those who saw him as a Yahoo, a yokel, a little Abner in cleats. And Bradshaw was seized by a self-doubt that threatened to send his career crashing to the ground. Though he bounced back, he never shook the tag of Bayou Bumpster. Indeed, he often seemed disoriented in Steelers' black and gold, more suited to tattered knee pants and suspenders. But talented teammates helped Bradshaw find his bearings. The Pittsburgh Steelers were destined to become the greatest team of the Sevens, and Bradshaw helped them fulfill their destiny. Bradshaw benefited from a stable of swift and graceful receivers, who in turn benefited from his awesome arching rockets. In 
1974, Bradshaw emerged as a confident, consistent, and yes, intelligent leader and pastor. Bradshaw not only found himself, he and the Steelers found each other. Together, they won a record four Super Bowls. During the 70s, there was no football team on earth more consistently powerful than Pittsburgh's men of steel. In that grandest the football spectacles, the Super Bowl, Terry Bradshaw rose to the magnitude of the event four times. In Super Bowl 13 against Dallas, he threw a record four touchdown passes. Super Bowl 14 brought Bradshaw MVP honors for the second straight year. With this triumph, Bradshaw had won twice as many Super Bowls as any quarterback in NFL annals. It had taken a while for Terry Bradshaw to attain maturity, but once he and the Pittsburgh Steelers matured together, they carved themselves a special place in pro football history. In 1961, the Minnesota Vikings drafted quarterback Fran Tarkenton. Maybe his offensive line was bad, or maybe they just wanted to move aside and watch him like everyone else. Whatever the reason, it forced Tarkington to invent maneuvers that no one had ever seen before. Fran's antics were disdainfully termed scrambling, an unpredictable improvisation that added color to the game. Tarkenton's offense could salvage success on plays that clearly should have been favors. Viking head coach Norm Van Brocklin was considered an offensive genius. Yet even he could not have designed on paper what Tarkenton and his teammates designed on the run. It was this logic-defying ability that caused his head coach to have nightmares. To our surprise, Francis had a very average arm, but he had ability to run. And since he has his ability, every time he gets in trouble a little bit, he takes off uh, running from one side to the other. Well, there's a standard joke on our team by our linemen that uh, if they miss their man, just to wait there because Francis will be coming back and he'll bring his man back to him. People have described Tarkenton as a scrambling type of quarterback. I, I suspect that that's about the best name you could put on him. Because of Fran, the Vikings were exciting. Even when they lost. Minnesota was often undone by the unpredictable play that made them unique. It has been suggested that a quarterback gets too much credit when his team wins and too much blame when they lose. After seven years of such suggestions, Fran Tarkenton was traded to the New York Giants where he was forced to test a personal belief. And I think a quarterback has got to have an arrogant quality about him because he's going to get shot at by so many people. And if he's paranoid, then, then he, uh, he'll never make it. Because during his career, he's going to have times when his teammates are going to doubt him, his coaches doubt him, fans doubt him, the press doubts him. And he's got to just wipe all that away. He's got to be arrogant enough to say, you know, I'm good. 
And I know what I'm doing, and, and I'm going to uh, press on. Tarkenden could not make the Giants a champion. But he did make them entertaining. Like always, Fran played every play as if it were a lifeboat drill. The results were usually completions or touchdown passes that would, in time, make him famous. In 1972, Fran was surprisingly traded back to his original team, the Minnesota Vikings. No longer an expansion joke. This was a veteran-laden champion, and they immediately extended a free reign to the most imaginative quarterback who has ever played pro football. Like all Tarkenton-led teams, the Vikings could score. But number 10 was still being criticized for the risk his mobility presented. It was his elusiveness that made him a prized catch of every defender who ever hounded his heels, and a gift that also earned him the respect of those very same men. Fran was exceptionally quick. He had that, that, uh, that ability to scramble, and, and we always thought he had eyes in the back of his head because he would make that move where he would reverse his feel just when you were just getting ready to tackle him. It was the best timing I'd ever seen. didn't want to believe that I could succeed being the type of quarterback or a different quarterback uh, that I was. And it took him a longer time to accept me as, a, as something more than a freak quarterback. Of all the knocks against Fran Tarkin, none endured longer and was less deserved than the one questioning his ability to throw a football. The name of the game is passing, and I think the whole thing of the arm is really overrated. I mean, I can throw the ball far enough, I can throw it hard enough, I can throw it with touch. In the history of the NFL, no quarterback ever completed more passes for more yards and more touchdowns than Francis Asbury Tottenham. Flash wide to the left, Gilliam in the slot to the left. First and goal from the seventh. Fran rolls to the right, dumps it out, caught by Foreman, touchdown! Fran Tarkington's record-breaking 291st career touchdown pass. During his 18-year career, no quarterback ever played in more games. He started in his first and in his last one, finishing with 342 touchdown passes and over 47,000 yards passing. He accomplished everything a quarterback could do, except win a Super Bowl. Although he never wore pro football's championship crown, his durable and enthusiastic career made him a remarkable jewel in the game's history, and one of the best ever. World Championship of Professional Football. The dream of every quarterback who has ever stood over Santa. During the 1960s, Bart Starr, the Green Bay Packers, developed into a great quarterback who led a great team to five NFL titles. The same was true of Bob Greaser, number 12, who directed the Miami Dolphins to consecutive Super Bowl victories in the early 70s. 
If the true measure of a quarterback is how many times he leads his team to the championship, then certainly one of the best ever is Otto Graham of the Cleveland Browns. And the quarterback is, is the catalyst. And Otto Graham played the, the role of a quarterback, which is the most important position insofar as having a team win for many years. And that's one of the reasons I say that Otto Graham was the greatest player I ever had. Though he never called his own plays, Graham's ability to execute Paul Brown's system made him a winner. In every season from 1946 to 1955, Otto Graham quarterbacked the Browns to a league or conference championship. For Yale Burton Abraham Tittle, it was his will to win that made him special. Y.A. was a tough, persistent operator for the San Francisco 49ers in the early 1950s. As a passer, Tittle was nearly an artist, yet ironically, number 14 is remembered best for a gimmick pass called the alley-oop. I never thought as a quarterback I'd ever resort to throwing an end over end lob lolly pass straight up in the air and hopefully somebody would come down and grab it for a touchdown, but that's what the alley-oop pass was. We had a receiver on our team named R.C. Owens that was a basketball player by trade. R.C. used to say, throw it as high as you can, straight up in the air, and please put a wobble on him because he could judge it better. In 1957, Tittle used the alley-oop to become the NFL's most valuable player. Ten seconds left. The Lions lead it. 31-28. All right. Again, Owens flank to the right. This has got to be the alley-oop. There's no time for anything else. Tittle throws. Owens is double teamed. He's going downfield near the goal line. He goes up. He's got it. Oh, in 1961, and at the age of 34, Tittle was traded to the New York Giants, where his career took a dramatic turn upward. Twice, Y.A. led the league in passing, and his 36 touchdown passes in 1963 set the NFL single-season record. records and awards he had in abundance. But what Tittle wanted most was an NFL championship. For 15 years, he committed his body and soul to this desperate chase, and Ahab mightily pursuing his great white whale. In 1963, Tittle stepped out of a hospital bed to play the Chicago Bears in the NFL championship. Sadly, however, courage was not enough. Though his will to win earned him a place in the Hall of Fame, in 1964, Y.A. Tittle was forced to retire without the one crown he treasured most. Lenny Dawson of the Kansas City Chiefs was a quiet, unassuming quarterback. But like all great quarterbacks, there burned an intense desire to win. This lifted Dawson from a journeyman NFL quarterback to one of the cornerstone stars of the American Football League. Though not the biggest, Dawson was tough. His confident sense of command earned him the nickname Lenny the Cool, while his ability to pinpoint beautiful spirals made him the NFL's third leading passer of all time. Yeah. 
However, in 1969, a knee injury forced Lenny out of action for seven games. He did return to lead the Chiefs into Super Bowl IV, but only a few believed that number 16 could defeat the mighty Minnesota Vikings. Come on, Lenny! Pump it in there, baby! Just keep matriculating the ball down the field, boys! Darson did not decimate the Vikings. He just beat them with workmanlike precision. Keep negotiating that ball right down the field, boys. For 19 years, Lenny Dawson was an outstanding field judge. But when he led his team to the world championship, Lenny earned a place among the best ever. A quarterback sets the tempo for his teammates. Like an orchestra conductor, his guidance must strike rhythms both subtle and storm. Few mastered this as deftly as Bobby Lay. Though his arm was suspect, he inspired less by passing than by passion. A passion for winning. I'm one person who hastes to lose. I don't care if we're playing marbles or gin rummy or what we're doing. I like to be a winner. I did have a bad arm, there's no question about it, but it doesn't really count how pretty the pass is. But one time I was the Pro Bowl game and I was there with four quarterbacks, Van Brockton, Tittle, Eddie LeBaron, and myself. I could throw it just as far as any of the rest of them, and uh, when I wanted to, it could be just as pretty. But you throw a touchdown pass, I don't care if it wobbles or goes end over end, it counts six. Lane directed the Detroit Lions to NFL championships in 1952 and 1953. You feel great walking down the street when you're a champion. You don't have to stand in line for picture shows. You get a free pass and you get in first. It's a great feeling. By instilling that feeling in others, Lane attained greatness. Norm Van Brocklin's strong desire to win was matched by an arm that made him the NFL's leading passer three times. In 1951, he led the Los Angeles Rams to an NFL championship as those who played with the Dutchman rose to match his tenacity with their own. In 1960, he ignited the Philadelphia Eagles to a championship showdown with Green Bay. It was the last game he ever played, but his magnificent obsession to be number one had not diminished. And Norm Van Brocklin became the only quarterback in history to lead two different teams to NFL championships. Roger Starbuck's leadership skills were nurtured at the U.S. Naval Academy. Starbuck's daring scuttled many a foe and earned him a Heisman Trophy. When he joined the Dallas Cowboys in 1969, he reverted to old instincts. Tom Landry knew Starbuck had much to learn. His running ability when he first came in the league was really a cover-up from lack of experience. There's no way a quarterback, until he learns to read defenses, until he learns to move a defense around and do the things he wants to do from the pocket, uh, until he learns that, then he's going to rely on what his best quality is. And Rodgers' greatest quality when he first started was running. As best qualities go, it was very good indeed. Starbuck was a bold and agile runner who became known as Roger the Dodger. Starbuck's running ability was but one manifestation of the competitive fire that burned beneath his cool surface. I'm aggressive uh, to a degree. As a quarterback, you, you got to keep your poise. You can't uh, get overly emotional because you've got a lot on your mind. You've got to do a lot of things mentally to control the game, but uh, you've got to be competitive, aggressive, and give everything you have physically. Yeah. 
Roger the Dodger gave way to a strong-armed passer who would become the top-ranked quarterback in NFL history. There was nothing mystical about Starbuck's transformation, but there was magic in the way his teammates performed for him. Starbuck became a worthy inheritor to the legacy established by Lane and Van Brocklin. During his 10-year career, he led the Cowboys to 10 consecutive winning seasons and two world championships. Starbuck's incredible courage was also inspiration. Few have endured such brutal punishment in the athletic arena. Cowboy fans pronounced many a last right for their fallen hero. But resiliency made him a winner. You know, a guy that they call a winner isn't someone that's going to win all the time. But man, when he's down, he's going to bounce back up with everything he has when he gets the chance. And boy, you bounce back when things aren't going your way. The irrepressible Starbuck generated 23 come-from-behind victories. 14 of them in the final two minutes are in overtime. In a 1975 playoff game at Minnesota, the Cowboys were reduced to a wing and a prayer. Well, the Cowboys need a miracle, as we said. Second and ten. Cowboys from the 50. Again, Starbuck has him in the shotgun formation. Roger takes the snap. Humps and watch. He's going long. Down the near sideline for Drew Pearson. Pearson takes the catch at the five. Touchdown! Would you believe it? They had great faith in him. They never thought they were out of it as long as Roger was throwing the ball. From that standpoint, uh, he was special. On July the 28th, 1979, the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, inducted the greatest quarterback who has ever played the game. From his bristle brush haircut to his high top shoes, no one ever looked quite like Johnny Unites. But then, nobody else ever played like Unitas either. He was the most daring, deadliest passer who ever played pro football, and the subject of one of the most improbable Cinderella stories ever told. Drafted ninth by the Pittsburgh Steelers in 1955, Unitas was overlooked and spent most of summer camp playing catch with owner Art Rooney's kids before being cut from the squad. He spent a season playing semi-pro ball before signing with the Baltimore Colts in 1956 for $7,000. By mid-season, number 19 was a starter. In only his second season, Unitas made the Pro Bowl. In 1958, Unitas led the Colts to the Western Conference title. Ahead lay the NFL championship, the New York Giants, and a step into pro football history.
The largest television audience of its time, 50 million tuned into sold-out Yankee Stadium. There, a 25-year-old quarterback demonstrated the poise, skill, and imagination that would make him the best ever. Tied at 17, Unitas put together one of the drives that would become his trademark during the first sudden death overtime in championship history. Up over the ball, come the ball to Mark Colts. Unitas calling out the signals. Roll, 25. Unitas gives to Amici. The Colts to the world champion. This epic made a legend of the man with a golden arm. For 18 years, his convincing pump fakes froze secondaries, allowing him to place the ball on his receiver's fingertips. The information, of course, that is more valuable than anything is the information that you receive from your own players or your own receivers. Unitas used this information and his talented receivers to pass for over 42,000 yards and 290 touchdowns, standards by which all other quarterbacks would be measured. However, his records and achievements gave no indication of the gains he won or influenced by the sheer force of his personnel. Each game in which he appeared, something dramatic and exciting happened, despite the fact that he was the bullseye for every defensive unit he faced. His brand of courage gave him a power of leadership that words alone could not have done. It is his special mark that although many are compared to John Unitas, John Unitas is never compared to anyone else. Two plays, first play, split right, 40 series right, second play, be a split right, pull back draw, both of them on run. Ready? For five years, in 47 straight games, Unitas threw at least one touchdown pass. Pro football's equivalent of Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak. The Colts won the NFL championship three times under Unitas. And three times he was named the league's most valuable player. Other quarterbacks have won more championships or compiled larger statistics. But none ever fit all the requirements of pro football's most demanding position as well as Johnny Unites, the best ever.